When I think of Bitcoin, I think this is the first digital monetary system in the history of the world. Perhaps the first, per we've tried others, they just didn't work. This is the first one that's perfected, that's functioning. It's the first one to, to cross $100 billion in market cap, and now it's about $200 billion in market cap. $200 billion means $200 billion of monetary energy. And if I look at all of the other great digital networks, Apple, Google, Facebook, when they cross $100 billion of monetary energy, then that's a legitimizing step. Generally, when they get there, 95% or more of the investment community doesn't believe in them. Sometimes 99% doesn't believe in them, but they're too big to fail. They're, they're fires that have been unleashed into the society and they're burning and the, the effect is exothermal. It's, it's, it's what we have in each of these networks is we have the collapse, a dematerialization of some product or service or virtue or some ineffable quality, be it friendship or mobile devices or information. It's collapsing into a lower energy state. Mm -hmm. And as it collapses into a lower energy state, hu huge amounts of energy in the form of profit, cash flow, and value get given off. App Apple can ship a, 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 better, a better camera to a billion people overnight for a nickel. Right, Facebook right. can improve the way that you communicate to your loved ones overnight for a nickel. And Google can package the Library of Alexandria in the palm of your hand and ship it to a billion people overnight for a nickel. And when, when you have these massive de dematerializations of value and they get on a network with a network effect, it's almost like what, what you see a crystallizing structure where you've got an amorphous substance and as it crystallizes we go from steam to water to ice collapses gives off energy and what what bitcoin is is it's that first digital monetary network digital monetary system it's collapsing into a a much more efficient form it's giving off energy and um that just brings us back to this entire subject of how important is energy to the human race Okay. Let, because, let me ask you. Sorry, let me ask a question yeah, there. There's a chart with phase, phase transitions of, say, water, of going from ice to water to steam as its temperature increases. And it shows increases in temperature. And then when it actually goes into the phase transition, it flatlines. So it's like all that energy is being reallocated to, I guess, changing the, stru the molecular structure for the next state. Then the, the temperature starts to increase again as it goes into water and it flatlines again before it goes into steam. So I guess what you're getting at is that energy becomes transmuted into the next state before it can start to give off energy in the form of profit, productivity. It's, it's giving back economic substance, I guess, to its users. Um, and I, I think that's sort of the analogy you're drawing there. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a wild thing when, when all the monetary energy leaps from gold to Bitcoin, or when it leaps from fiat to Bitcoin, there's this phase transition. And, uh, and, and um, we see it uh, throughout all, all areas of science. But right now, this is, this is uh, just the first time in human history that we see uh, this creation of a, a pure digital monetary network. And I, I want to replace monetary network with energy network because monetary uh, energy is energy and money is energy. In fact, money is the highest form of energy. So if we ask the question, what is money? Money is the highest form of energy that human beings can channel. Hmm. So if I look back through time, human beings as a species prosper by channeling energy. And when we mastered fire, we channeled chemical energy. And when we mastered missiles, we channel kinetic energy. And when we master water and hydraulics, 
we're actually channeling gravitational energy. The idea of an aqueduct is, well, I'm using gravity to move water 70 miles, or I'm running a water wheel, or I'm floating a two-ton uh, block in the water, and the gravity's pushing down on the water, and the water is pushing up. And when I dam a stream and I generate hydro energy, well, that's that's gravity being converted energy. But if I dam the stream to divert a bunch of fish into my pond, I'm still using gravity. Now, I, I can channel gravity by dumping a bunch of rocks on your head, but it's not nearly so easy to create a river of rocks as it is to actually just tap into a river of water. And, uh, and so the mastery of fire and water is the mastery of, of chemical energy, gravitational energy, eventually thermal en en energy. And, and that, in the modern era, morphed into the, the mastery of electrical en energy and atomic energy. And of course, of course, there's conservation of energy. And when we look at all of these energy networks, I mean, look, 100 guys with bows and arrows are an energy network, right? I'm, I'm moving kinetic energy from this side of the battlefield to that side of the battlefield. And, and um, a civilization at the mouth of a river with cities up and down the river, right, is sitting on an energy network, right? Just like the Aegean and the Greek civilization was sitting at the middle of an energy network and they were using gravitational energy to, to uh, you know, and by the way, wind energy, right? Another form of energy right. with, between sails and gravity. You know, I, I'm taking advantage of these energies. So the theme is humans prosper by channeling energy. Yeah. Now, what's the most efficient energy network in the history of the world? Well, it's about to be Bitcoin. Um, because the challenge of humans, humanity is how do I store energy and transmit energy across time and space and domain. And by domain, I mean perhaps governmental domain. Like how do I move my energy from New York to Tokyo? And this becomes an interesting question, right? Let's say, let's take a, a typical power grid. Well, I generate uh, power, I channel chemical energy into electrical energy. I lose like 35% of the energy in the coal or in the fossil fuel, when it gets onto the grid, I move it over a high voltage line and, it, and I can move it up to about 500 miles and I lose 2% of the energy. Mm -hmm. Now it has, to go, it has to get stepped down to 240 volts or lower voltage even to get into your house. I lose, as, as the voltage steps down, I lose more energy. It's about a 4% loss. I can, if I had pure energy at the power plant, I'm going to lose 6% of the energy to put it into your house 250 miles away. I can't send it 2,000 miles away. I just can't. I can't send it 10,000 miles away. Energy will not move from New York to Tokyo, but I can do New York to Schenectady. Now, when it gets into your house, you have to use it immediately. You can't store it. So let's say I wanted to store it. I need a battery. Well, the absence of a battery prevents a mechanism. Uh, the mobile wave is a function of lithium ion batteries in the palm of your hand. No, no lithium ion battery, no smartphone. Now, we're, we're working with modern batteries, you know, Tesla. All, it's all about the battery, right? <laughs> And, uh, and Elon Musk has really driven battery technology. So let's say I put a battery in your house and you pull energy into your house. Well, you've lost 6%. Now, a typical battery, a good one, is going to lose 2% per month. Okay, that means you're going to lose 24% of your energy a year. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like 24% inflation a year. Yeah. It sounds... You know, it sounds like hyperinflation, it could get worse, right? Hyperinflation oh. is 100% inflation here. Let's say that I have a battery which loses 20% of my power a year. Well, my half-life on my energy that I pulled off the plant is three and a half years in 10 years, right? Yeah. I'm up to 12 and a half percent of my energy. So the entire civilization is based upon electric power grids and networks, and yet it's not that good. I mean, you really can't store that much power. 
anybody that ever put their computer, they charged it and left the computer for a month or two months and you whipped it open, it's like, it's drained. It's dead, yeah. Okay, so now, let's say I wanna take a hundred million dollars, by the way, I can take a hundred million dollars of money and I can buy a hundred million dollars of electricity in New York and I can distribute it to 10 million people in New York as long as they use it today. But, it, you know, so, so if they don't use it today, it starts to bleed out and where, and so this is, this is uh, the loss on the network right. now. And in a monetary sense, we would say that energy really lacks durability, right? And I think this is important to you to tie this back to money is that gold itself, to your point, was an energy network, right? It was whatever productivity couldn't be allocated towards something more economic, we would go and mine gold, such that gold became this claim on savings of humanity, which is what money is. And those savings themselves are the result of all our collective energy utilization up until that point, right? We've been tra transitioning energy into capital and then gold or money becomes the network that commands that capital. And then I, what I think is interesting too is that the scarcity of the gold actually reflects the scarcity of the energy, right? So it maps onto it in a way. A brilliant insight. And now let's play a thought experiment. Let's take our $100 million worth of monetary energy and let's put it in a, a power network and then uh, that runs on copper. And then let's put it into a gold network. If I put it into a copper energy network, I have a 24% bleed rate per year by the time it gets to the battery. I lose 6% and I can't get it more than 500 miles. Okay, so that it's a very short term, short duration, here and now energy network. Let's put it into a gold network. I put $100 million into gold. Now I can move that $100 million of gold 100 miles. Would I lose 6%? No, probably not 6%, right? I, I could probably lose 100, move $100 million of gold 100 miles for $10,000 to $100,000, depending upon how much security I need. So we're talking about 10 basis points instead of 600 basis points of loss, 10 basis points. So gold is a more efficient way to move large amounts of energy uh, short periods of time or short distances. What if I want to move $100 million worth of gold 10,000 miles? Well, that's about 3,000 pounds of gold, like one and a half tons. So I put it on a global express, cost $10,000 an hour. I put some dudes with guns on it. I fly 16, 18 hours around the world. That's about $180,000 plus another 70,000, 250,000. If I have to fly the plane back, let's just assume I don't. It's 250,000. So now, now we're up to like 25 basis points, 0.25%. Is the cost to move it around the world once? Okay, so, so that's okay. Now, what if I want to deliver a hundred million dollars of gold a hundred years into the future? Oh, right. what if I want to deliver a hundred million dollars of of energy a hundred years in the future on um, copper and batteries? Well, my half life is a 24%, a 2% bleed a month, right? My half-life is three and a half years. It's gone completely. And everybody with any common sense knows if you put your laptop charged in your attic for a hundred years, it will not be charged in a hundred years. Right, you right, cannot right. store electricity on a copper network or a lithium ion battery, it's no good. I put it in gold, put it in a vault. Okay, so let's say I put it in a vault in JP Morgan. And I put in the vault in JP Morgan in 1900 in the United States of America. And the United States is the most successful country in the 21st, 20th century. We win every war 
and JP Morgan remains as a bank and the vault is, and New York remains. In that case, assuming a 2% mining rate, so assuming a stock to flow of 50 and miners mine 2% more gold a year, the half-life of a gold battery is 35 years. Mm -hmm. I go from 100 million to 50 million in 35 years to 25 million in 70 years to about 12 and a half million in 100 years. So I've, de I've depleted my gold battery 87% if the United States wins every war. Right. And if JP Morgan is in a corrupt institution and doesn't fail, and if no one drops a nuclear bomb on New York City. Right. If so those it, things don't happen, then I will get 12% of my money back. So in addition to betting on gold, right, which is governed by natural law, you're also assuming this counterparty risk in the form of the US government, in the form of JP Morgan. You have to bet on these on stability in the geopolitical landscape as well, right? Because the gold has to be secured and it has to be secured by institutions, 